Hello, hello, you're very welcome. Hopefully uh, everything is working as it should do. I'm just literally pressed the live button there, so I'm just checking, making sure the broadcast is actually happening. So just bear with me for a second there while I just check in and make sure all the technology is working. Thanks a million for stopping by this evening. If you've uh, just entered the room, thank you very much. I can see we are definitely live on Facebook and everything is working, so that's brilliant. So um, thanks for coming along, you're very welcome. So this evening is the first in a series of talks that I wanted to do. I guess we have a you know great community of people at Explore Light and just trying to do things to have different ways of connecting with people and share some things about photography. I'm also gonna make sure that every evening I'm giving a talk like this, I'm also having a little tipple of wine. So if you're having a glass at home yourself, fair play, cheers. I have a little something from South Africa here that a buddy gave me, South African Pinot Noir, and it is absolutely delicious. So I apologize in advance if the quality of the talk denigrates a little bit as I get through things but I'll do my best. I think I'll be busy, so I won't have too much time to, <laughs> to drink that, basically. Anyway, let's get into it. So, tonight I was gonna discuss some Irish photographic locations. And the idea with this was that I would basically show you some images, discuss how I took the images, talk about the locations in terms of what time of year to go, where's the compositions within the particular location, and then also try and look at some post-processing from those locations. So for this evening, I picked three places that I thought were really beautiful and iconic Irish locations. So we have Derry Clare Lock, which is in Connemara. We have Down Patrick Head, which is in County Mayo, and we have my local Glendalock. So I'm gonna go through those three places pictures, all the bits I just mentioned, and hopefully that'll be of some use in terms of giving you a reasonably entertaining hour or discussion about photography, which we're all passionate about, and also give you some ideas of what to do yourselves if you're in those places and some inspiration. Anyway, let's jump in. I need to share the screen. I need to make sure all of this stuff is working. Here we go. It was pretty seamless in the test, but uh, you know, there's always room for there's always room for these uh, for these things to uh, to go awry. So let's just see how we get on here. Okay, and there we go. So first up, when you're photographing any photographic location, is you have to consider the angle of the sun. Now. But the first place I want to look at is um, actually going to be the 12 uh, Benz area down in Connemara, Derry Clare Lock. And if I zoom in here, this is Derry Clare Lock, okay? And just to put that in context, if I zoom out a little bit, you can see it's along the N59, and the N59 goes all the way from Galway out to Clifton and Derry Clare Lock is along that N59 there. And it's a super easy location to access because you just literally park here beside it and then you can walk to this little mound here and shoot across the island of pine trees here or you can walk around this side and shoot back across them. There's a whole kind of host of different places that you can shoot this from but I just wanted to point out that it is lovely and easy to park and lovely, easy to, lovely and easy to get to as well. And I also wanted to just point out the lighting angles. So Derry Clare Lock can be shot at sunrise or sunset. Probably a more popular sunrise location. And just before I continue too much further, this is what it looks like, just in case people have no idea <laughs> what I'm talking about, I'm sure any of the Irish contingent that are watching know exactly what I'm talking about, but just before I go on any further, this is Derry Clare Lock, so just so you have that idea of what's going on. But what I wanted to just discuss initially was that sunrise sunset thing. So this orange line here represents the sunset, and this yellow line here represents the sunrise. Now, if you look up here in the top left corner, it says June 22nd. So that's the angles of the sun 
in the summer basically and honestly i do not advise going to photograph this in the summer years ago when i started taking pictures i went down there and i camped beside it in the middle of june and i got up in the morning i had a most blisteringly beautiful sunrise but i have never been so attacked by the midges in my whole life like it was absolutely brutal so if you are going to go do it in the summer just beware <laughs> the midges are are really really brutal in the summer but what the summer does give you is it gives you the light coming directly in behind the island so look at that angle there and now if we switch to let's say the autumn and i'm going to go for october 19th look how different the angle of the sun is so whenever you're photographing a location whether it's ireland or somewhere else you have to consider that the lighting angle changes substantially over the course of the year and if something is backlit like the light is coming in behind it you're going to get much darker shapes in the trees at this location for example or if it's more in the autumn time you're getting side lighting the island is going to be much more lit up so the angle of the sun at a given time of year is crucially important and i don't think people sometimes appreciate how much the lighting angle actually changes over the course of the year so let's say if we go to the extremity there with Derry Clare Lock and we look at the 21st of December look it's almost front lit from this angle here the lights coming across in this direction whereas if we go to the other extreme and we go to June 21st oops you can't quite see it there because it's hidden behind the moon but I'll just go a few days on here and we should be able to see what's going on uh, let's say july 11th there we go now we can see that it's up in the north and if you look at the sunset angle you can see again that it's coming from the north in the summer and if we go to the autumn it's starting to come from the south so you're more likely to get side lighting basically at Derry clare lock in connemara in the autumn when we get to the summer or sorry, when we get to right into the winter, it starts to become more front lit because the sunlight's gonna creep around even further to the south here. And when we're in the depths of summer, it's gonna be backlit because the sun is right up there in the north. So that's just something to consider and yeah, something to um something to be aware of with all locations um that you're that you're shooting. So I can see a few comments coming in um nick blake all good thanks greg hello hello nick uh hello from costa rica hey brad carla's there how are you carla carol paul Byrne says nice wine there we go paul actually geez, you just reminded me i better have another sip i don't want to be i don't want to be you know just constantly talking i better make sure i have those sips as we go through david potts brian scanlon says hello hey brian hey david hey andrew how are you all doing guys give us a comment say hello there um if you're if you're watching i can see we have uh we have lots of people in here already watching so that's great um thanks again so much uh for attending so let's keep going with the with the photography so light those lighting angles being crucially important the other thing that's really crucially important if you want to go to Derry clare lock is ideally you want to shoot it with a reflection so if you look at the lake itself here and there's those there's that island of pine trees that you could see in some of those other pictures it's a narrow little kind of inlet here almost so it does actually get the reflection quite easily like it's not in a big open expanse of lake so ideally you want to see winds of seven kilometers or less but it's the kind of place if it's maybe even 10 or 15 i'd still might take a risk on it it's not going to be flat cam all the way to the back of the lake but you might get enough reflections in your foreground for those trees to really work so yeah absolute cam is ideal but you know still somewhere you can consider going um even if even if it's not absolutely calm. Steve is saying hello. Lisa is saying hello from America. Barry Dillon here in Dublin. Claire Edwards, how's it going? Jacqueline Moe, Jeffrey, Timothy, Dino, Helen, Henry. God, there's loads of people here, Edward. Thank you so much again, lads and ladies. Um, so shout out to you all. Um, yeah, so wind, important, but not as important as a 
big lake location and that's something to consider always when you're photographing lakes if it's let's say it's 10 or 12 kilometer wind i might go to shoot a lake that has a like a little inlet like that because i know that then there's a chance of it still reflecting um so just something something to bear in mind with it uh, obviously the real mecca there is to get the mist and to get that in behind the island and you know what you're looking for there with the mist at Derry Clare Lock like any location is absolute stillness overnight and a swing in temperature so you know autumn and spring are better or more likely to have mist because you know it might be 15 or 20 degrees during the day and then it drops down low at night so you get that crisp air in the morning and it makes it much more likely than in the summertime where you know in Ireland it might be 20 degrees during the day and then drop down to 15 or something like that at night we don't have that big shift in temperatures in the summer I'm sure the weather's crap and we'll be drinking white wine then anyway keep going so let's take a look at the pictures for a sec so I want to show you in these pictures from Derry Clare the different shooting angles uh, that um, are worth taking a look at so let's look through some of the pictures in that context. So this for me is the, the easiest access, the most iconic sort of uh, place to take a picture at Derry Clare Lock. And this was, this was possibly the best light I've ever got there. And I took this picture years and years and years ago. Um, we just had absolute stillness all the way to the back of the lake. And we had all the fog rolling in at the mountains in the backdrop and it's just, beyond beyond perfect you know um i like this position it gives you just a slight bit of elevation the mountain kind of tucks in from the left you can see it over here on this side but the light was absolutely spectacular that morning just beyond spectacular and if i have a quick look in here at the map that shot was standing on this little hill here just looking out towards the island so just a very simple place park here walk up on this hill and then look straight out couldn't be much easier before i jump back into the pictures actually i'll show you the next few we're going to look at down here on the left hand side and actually going out onto this walkway here and just give you an idea of how the images change as you walk around a little bit so this is down below that little hillock if you go to the left you see these little reeds in your foreground they just pick up a little bit of light you need to be careful with that uh, spot to the left there because sometimes the lake is totally flooded and you can't actually um, get access to this point to see see the, the the island like this and sometimes if the reeds are in full sort of growth um, it obstructs the island too much and it's not a good position on this particular morning i was just watching this cloud that's kind of sitting above the island just move across and i was just waiting for it just to be just above the island just in that moment and you know when we're looking at clouds we don't really perceive that they're moving very quickly i think certainly on a still morning but even on a still morning i could see it visibly moving across the sky <clears throat> and I just loved how it sat just above the uh, just above the island there um, and I grabbed a shot this is moving further along out to the walkway this is a, a little bit further along in the in the year as well so you can see the light is coming right in behind it and you can see how different it looks when it's backlit like it is in this situation versus being side lit on the previous one the lights coming across it so it's going to illuminate the foreground a little bit more but when the lights coming in behind it it's going to create much more of a silhouette so like those factors those factors of the position of the light make such a difference to the mood and energy and distribution of tone in your pictures so whenever I'm planning and when I'm teaching people all that, I'm really trying to drill that home for them, for their own planning, you know, to consider all these things. I guess from my own point of view, that's a big part of my job when we're doing the workshops is deciding where to go, trying to get people into the best position for the best shots. And I'm always thinking of the angle of the light. That's the first thing that we think of, the angle of the light versus 
what the location looks like with side light or backlight, how much clouds there are. And all those things inform your decisions about where you're gonna go and shoot. Um, so a little bit more backlit out onto the path. And then here's another one right out onto the path, this time uh, with uh, a much wider angle um, and bringing in everything kind of from that left side as well and the trees all the way over on the right. I should say that most of these shots uh, have required a little bit of a blend because the trees do go right up over the horizon at Derry Clare Lock. So you have this very bright light, even when it's side lit, it's kind of side to back. It's not quite in front of the trees um, in the autumn um, like it is here. It's It's got around, but it's it's still creating a tiny bit of backlighting. Um, so that creates a wide dynamic range, uh, which means that when you have a wide dynamic range, you're much more likely to have to blend your exposures, especially when you have something protruding up over the horizon, because we don't want to pull a filter down over something that's protruding up over the horizon, because it'll create a harsh line. Um, so that's going out along this path. Now, if it's been flooded and it's been pouring rain, you actually won't see anything of this path because it'll be totally covered up um, by the water. So I wanna show you a couple of other things about this location before I'm gonna stop talking about it. So the shots that I just showed you there, it's at this bank at the top, then moving down to the left out to this kind of pathway here. But it's also great to shoot uh, from this right hand side here and you kind of just there's another little path which leads you down and you go out onto this little outcrop here and when you go out onto that little outcrop there what happens is the island itself the pine island kind of sits between the mountains out there um, so that can be um, that can work really really good a different totally different type of composition to when you're closer to the trees and the other pictures you still want stillness you still ideally want a little bit of mist you can see this shot is very blue like it's really way before sunrise i took this picture maybe 50 minutes or an hour before sunrise because we had a good forecast with you know crisp conditions not as much mist as actually i expected there to be but a little bit so when you've got like those crispy clear conditions get there early at Derry Clare Lock, anywhere you're going to shoot lakes where you've got swings in temperature, you know, warm in the day, cool at night, stillness, that's the good chance for the mist. Um, so um, that's, this, that's that other position around to the right hand side. No problems with the dynamic range at this pre-dawn light, no filters needed because you're naturally getting a slow exposure and you just throw it on and shoot you know and um, you should be able to capture everything in terms of the dynamic range and here it is uh, same morning uh, as the light came through and um, the clouds uh, really lit up um, so I see a few more people coming in there hey Steve and Breed is in Teresa Richard Dino Patrick and loads and loads of people in here uh, Owen and Chaz uh, Hello from Dallas. Chaz, wow, we like that one. Thanks a million, Chaz. Appreciate it. Dino says good situations. That's that's Dino's catch line for good light, basically. So if you're on a workshop with Dino and he says it's a good situation, you know what he's talking about. Derry Clare Lock as well is great for these clean foregrounds where you have quite an open bit of water to just shoot minimally the trees through the center, like in this composition. So if you have good clouds and good shapes in the clouds, Again, it's worth trying to marry up the shapes that are in the sky with the middle ground. And what I mean by that is if you looked at that picture a couple of images back, I had that cloud just sitting right on top of the island. I'll show you again. So this picture here, I got that cloud just in the right position above the island. And same with this image here. I've really conscious that that curvy shape of that cloud top and bottom kind of almost engulfs uh engulfs the um engulfs the uh the whole scene barry just said he lost audio uh, can everybody else hear me guys uh, maybe you could just let me know if you can hear me i just i it, according to my stream here the the sound is good maybe you could drop me a comment and just let me know that you can still hear me i'd appreciate it
It'll give me time to give me time to have a, a drink of wine. <laughs> Okay, so people can hear me, Barry. So I think it might be something with your computer. I'm sorry. Yeah, so the shape of those clouds and how it really envelops the island, that's something to consider if you're ever shooting there um, to try and marry that up a little bit with, um, with the island in the center. But this was, I mean, hopefully you can agree it was just a stunningly beautiful morning of light and it's... Um, it's an absolutely uh, fabulous, fabulous location. A fabulous, fabulous location. Okay, there we go. I've adjusted the I've adjusted the uh, the mic a little bit there. So someone said the volume was low, Patrick. So hopefully that's a, a little bit better now, and I'm gonna speak with a little bit more purpose. Try not to move the mic uh, with the wine. Okay, so that's Derry Clare Lock. That was the first one that I wanted to show you something about. And uh, I also want to just, while we're here on Derry Clare Lock, I just want to mention a couple of things about the processing. So if I go in to Lightroom, and here's a shot uh, from a, uh, a shoot there last year, and you can see we have a dynamic range issue here. We have a very light sky. We have some light on the foreground, but the sky is basically burnt out. And what I find difficult when I'm here is if I try and pull a filter over these trees, I really blacken the top of the trees here and the light in behind it um, can, be, uh, can be difficult to, um, to hold in without blackening the trees with a grad. So I do just like to generally do blends here. I just see Dave saying there's a volume adjustment and mute on the player just in case you've knocked it down. Cheers for that Dave, appreciate it mate. Um, so hopefully people can, can figure that out. So I would advise making a couple of exposures here and doing a blend. And if I'm doing a blend, I have a darker picture here for the sky. I have a lighter picture here for the foreground. Sometimes I'll make multiple pictures, uh, a few for the mid-tones uh, to bring it all together. Um, so I'm just gonna right click on these images and I'm gonna hit Photo Merge and HDR. And that's gonna create uh, a blended version of the two pictures from Derry Clare Lock. And really why I just want to, I'm not gonna do like a full processing thing on any of the images this evening, but in the context of giving you like some detailed information about these locations, I want to, I guess, raise some of the processing issues that come up at each location so that you're better equipped uh, when you go down there yourselves to shoot it. So first thing to say is leave auto align on, don't touch the ghosting and make sure auto settings are turned off. When auto settings are turned on, it looks better initially in some respects, but my God, does it destroy the contrast. So just turn auto settings off and hit merge. And that's a, that's a general kind of point that I would just avoid uh, with those auto settings. Adrian has asked me, have you ever tried climbing the hill behind the parking area? It gives you a higher viewpoint and isolates the island. That could be nice, Adrian. I'd be interested to see that. The only thing I guess, and I was going to talk about this in quite a lot of detail when we look at uh, down Patrick head and I'm not sure about the position that you're talking about but I did see somebody had a shot I assumed it was with a drone and it was like quite elevated looking down but when you look down on something like trees uh, and you you tr you put your camera at a, an extreme angle to something that's actually straight what you do is you make it all uh, kind of the perspective gets very distorted. And I personally don't like that. We're gonna talk about that with Dan Patrick Head. And as I said, I'm not sure if that relates to your, to your suggestion, but just be careful of pointing down on things that are meant to be upright. It's good to keep your camera square and upright, the things that are actually upright. Um, Jacqueline just asked me, or Jackie there, can I repeat how you uh, merge the settings together? So you just right click on the files that you want to merge and a, a menu will appear and it says photo merge on it and you click HDR. And just make sure that the auto settings box is turned off, which is this box here. 
leave auto align on and turn the ghosting off. So the reason that um, I keep those auto settings off is I like to build back the dynamic range myself rather than let the software aggressively stretch the shadows and highlights because that looks awful. So instead of you know doing something like this, which the automation will do, it'll bring up the shadows and it'll bring down the highlights. Well, I'm just gonna duplicate that file for a second, okay? And I'm gonna put this back to zero. So this is the original point we were in. And what I'm gonna do instead of what just happened there is I'm gonna make a selection of the sky. And then I'm going to intersect the sky with a linear gradient to try and hold the sky in a little bit better, but also to protect the trees when I bring things down with that linear gradient. And then I'm going to take a radial gradient and I'm going to put it through the center area where I want people to look and I'm going to lift the shadows in there and I'm going to lift the exposure in there a little bit. And the point I want to make in regards to what I just did was essentially when you have those auto settings on, it's pulling the shadows and pulling the highlights as I just mentioned. And that's increasing the dynamic range, but it's also stopping the image being very directional. So when we look at the version where I pull the shadows and pull the highlights, it's not very directional. But when we look at the version where I've done it myself, you can see your eye is much more clearly drawn into the island. So I like to restore dynamic range, not by using the auto settings, pulling shadows, pulling highlights. That also introduces a ton of halos, so you need to be careful using that. But instead, I like to use the adjustments that are at my disposal like the sky mask the linears the radials all those local adjustments in lightroom to restore the dynamic range myself because once i've blended the file together the dynamic range is there it's encompassed in that new dng and then it's just about you developing it and revealing what's there so i'm not going to do a full edit on the dairy claire lock i just wanted to make the point that it requires a bit of blending um, try to bring the light to the island um, when you're editing it. Potentially clean your camera a little better than I did before you go and shoot there so you don't have to clean up all this dust and crap. Although I have to say my mirrorless camera now is just gets so dusty compared to uh, my old D850. So I don't know, I don't know who's to blame, <laughs> but it's, it's definitely very, uh, very prone to getting dirty. Anyway, that's a bit about Derry Claire Lock. I'm going to move away from Derry Claire Lock now. So if you want to throw in anything in the uh, in the in the comments, um, a question about that, I'll try and field it um, in between. I can see uh, Chaz uh, saying, "All I can hear is bracket like hell, bracket like hell." A little bit of water and turn it into wine. So yes, Chaz, I probably would be screaming at you when we're on these various shoots, bracket, bracket, bracket. And I guess when the light goes off, what I always feel is, you know, just get the shots in the can quickly because once it changes, you know, the light's gone and you don't have an opportunity potentially to get it again. So act quickly, bracket, get the range of exposures in the can and then you can deal with it afterwards. Uh, uh, Leslie just asked me to mention the power lines. Yeah, I can absolutely mention the power lines. So there are these power lines here at Derry Clare Lock, uh, which are really annoying uh, and uh, go right in front of this incredible view. But as you can see, they are uh, very kind of hidden in the trees somewhat and they're quite discreet here. So any picture that I've ever shot there, I have removed the power lines in the processing excuse me, which requires a little bit of Photoshop work rather than Lightroom work, to be honest, to get them out properly. But you're absolutely right, they are annoying. Okay, next up, let's look at Down Patrick Head. County Mayo, from Connemara to County Mayo. Okay, further north, further north, haven't gone 
I haven't gone far enough. There we go. So Down Patrick Head is a location in North Mayo. I'll zoom back out a little bit now so I can give you some context now that I found it. So we were down in Clifton here before or down by the N59. Down Patrick Head is right up here in North Mayo. And uh, it's a nice, easy location to access. Uh, what I might just do is, for people who have no idea what I'm talking about, is I will just pull up a picture of Down Patrick Head so you can see what it's all about. It's a, it's a very beautiful sea stack and um, it's, in a, it's an iconic Irish location, I think it's fair to say. Um, absolutely stunningly beautiful place on that kind of precipice of the Atlantic and uh, we're gonna show you a few pictures of it and um, try and give you some insights again. So, Again, let's look at the lighting angle. So there's Down Patrick Head. Actually, before we do that lighting angle, let's just talk for a second about how you get there. So there's a car park just at the bottom here. Easy access, uh, park right up to it. Single classic Irish country roads. Um, you know, look like they're made for one car, but they're actually made for two cars. Uh, so yeah, beware, beware. Um, I just see one more question before I go on to this. Sorry, guys. Uh, when shooting with mist, are you better due to long exposures or shoot faster and freeze the action? Um, what I would say with that, uh, Stephen, is uh, with mist, if it's very still, I don't really worry too much about the long exposures. I don't think it affects it too much unless you're seeing the mist come through the scene. Sometimes it can be nice to do a long exposure and it kind of you see it rolling over a hill. Um, more what my thought process in sh shooting long or shooting quick at those lakes is, is there any ripples in the water? If there's any ripples in the water, then I definitely want to smooth them out. Um, so as I said, yeah, it's more about smoothing out the water rather than smoothing out the mist. But there can be a case, as I said, if you're seeing the mist come over, rolling over a hill, a long exposure can leave a lovely shape to it, you know? Um, what's the best Photoshop tool for removing power lines? Uh, it's a combination of things. I would say the new remove, t remove tool, John, is good. Um, what I normally do when I'm trying to remove those power lines um, in Derry Clare Lock is uh, I do it incrementally. So uh, what I mean by that is basically you won't get rid of them in one foul swoop. You just won't make them totally disappear in one fell swoop but if you essentially break them apart a little bit uh, it makes it much easier to get rid of them so for example um, if i have the power lines that are about to appear here oops so well they're not really over the sky in this image let's look over here so for example if i try to get rid of these in one fell swoop it's also it's often a problem so what i normally do is i take the clone let's say like that look and then i'd clone that and then i might clone a little bit here so you've all almost isolated them Do you see what i mean they're isolated from the rest of them and then once i have them isolated then i can go over it with the remove tool something like that. I find when they're all connected together, uh, Photoshop gets confused and tries to, I don't know, it picks things from odd places. So there you go, now that's totally clean, you see? That's gone, now this is a bit smudgy looking, so you can go in and reclone on that. But the trick is, for me, it's the combination of the clone tool and the remove tool. Using the clone tool to break the lines into little segments, and then you can just go over the segments with the remove tool and it should sort it out pretty easy. Okay. So, down Patrick Head, just to remind you, sorry, I just saw a few comments come in there, guys, questions about the previous. There must be a little bit of a lag with the, the questions uh, coming in for me with how I have the software set up here. Um, so down Patrick Head, very easy to park, as I said. Um, drive right up to the car park, and then you have to walk up to the headland to get this view. There's the Dunbreach, the stack, right there. And you're kind of standing up here on this headland, looking out 
shooting the C stack to get this view. Um, so what I want to just say about that is consider the lighting angle and consider your angle to the stack if you're ever there shooting it. So in the winter, okay, there's the stack, that's where you're shooting, you potentially get side light across it. If you want very dramatic light at Dunbriesta, like I've had, look where the sun is. It's right in behind it. So what time of year is that? That is in the summertime. Come back out of it again. In here, look at the lighting angle. Um, and I remember specifically when I took this picture because myself and Dara uh, were away for a few days scouting in the west and we met Michael McLaughlin and we had a few, few glasses of wine and it was the, remember the first lockdown and that end of June where we were kind of allowed to go off out, out of the county and do all that. So it was that first week that we were allowed to go off and we went off at the end of June um, for a few days uh, camping and shooting and um, that would have been the end of June. So, I mean, look at where the light is there. Uh, somewhere like that, you see? So the sun is directly behind it. So you'll never get a picture of Dunbrista looking like that with that feeling of the light coming behind it unless you do it in the summer. So again, that's just what I'm always trying to kind of teach people about, I'm just pouring the wine here, is the angle of the sun is so crucial to how the picture looks, you know? And when you know when you're really making progress with your photography, when your planning really incorporates that and you go, well, I like the look of Dunbrista with the sun kind of coming in, a backlit, big, colorful sky like this. And you go, well, that's only gonna happen in the summer. So I'm gonna plan my visit there for, for that period, you know, and uh, then you really improve your strike rate by thinking like that. So I wanna make a couple of general points about Dunbrista and the angles for shooting it and uh, a couple of things to consider if you ever go there. This is not a good picture. Uh, this is a picture taken with my iPhone as well. It's unprocessed. But the reason I show this picture is that if you look at the bottom of the stack, the bottom of the stack is much narrower than the top of the stack. Now, I am not a scientist, <laughs> but I don't think that the weight would be supported if it was so much narrower at the bottom and so much wider at the top. Maybe I'm wrong, but irrespective of my scientific input on this, it doesn't look like that, okay? The reason, uh, the reason that it looks like that is because it was pointing the camera downwards, pointing the camera at a, at a really downward angle, okay? So when you're shooting Dumbrista, what you want to try and do is to keep the camera reasonably straight because you're on a kind of a cliff at a level with it and you have to point down a little bit, but personally, I don't like to aggressively point down because it absolutely warps the shape of the stack. I've seen a lot of pictures which are warped like that. People often shoot with this little um, kind of opening in the rock with the stack in the background. Now, I've tried to actually keep that reasonably flat. Again, it's just a phone picture just to, uh, just to illustrate, um, but, I've tried to keep it reasonably straight. Whenever I see the pictures of this, I see that warped thing going on, uh, which a stack is like that, and that's from pointing the camera aggressively down. Um, some of the explorer like people will be slightly irked to hear me say this, but what you need is a tilt shift lens, I'm sorry to say, and that will that will sort things out. Uh, Barry's asking what time of day, I presume you're talking about that, uh, the very colorful one, Barry, that's a sunset in the summer. Um, when that picture was uh, was that was taken, and Barry is saying, beware of that grass is hollow underneath. So, yeah, you have to be always careful in these locations um, and watch your step. It's the landscape, so it's not a it's not a paved it's not a paved road for sure. So, one of the things I wanted to mention about the location was, as you move across the cliff top there the shape of the stack changes significantly. 
I actually don't really like this picture uh, and I've just included it to show you that when you move to the left hand side of the stack like where this one is taken for me it looks very flat looking and um, I personally prefer to shoot it a little bit more straight on because then you see the left hand side and you see the right hand side and that creates a triangle on the stack in the front of the picture you see the way you can see this side you can see that side and for me that creates more depth in the picture and allows the eye to move through the picture like a bit more freely whereas that side angle that it's you're just seeing one wall of the stack and not the whole thing so beware that when you're up there you can move you know four or five yards and the stack will look quite different so you know move around a little bit and get a feeling for um the actual kind of physical appearance of the stack in your shots you know um it'll it'll it'll, it'll really significantly change as you as you move around this particular image is uh one exposure except for this area on the left and i've just blended in that little bit of sunlight when you shoot directly into the light at Dunbrishta in the summer you can expect things to burn out because it's just going to be so bright in behind there I've um, lightened the um, water a little bit like the white color in the long exposure I can't remember exactly how long the time of the exposure is but it's at least 30 seconds possibly even a minute and if you want that very clean minimal look to your pictures at Dunbrishta yeah, I would encourage you to, to go with those longer exposures, especially if you have a little bit of white around the stack like I had here, because again, it just creates a little bit of extra shape in the foreground. Or if you have much more swell and it's breaking up on the stack like it was in this evening, then you can use a quicker exposure. So I guess with this one there was a little bit of movement down the bottom but not much but it's still enough with the long exposure that it gave that little bit of white whereas this one the water was actually rushing up and down it and um, we're getting some incredible movement so this exposure is just a couple of seconds so it blurs it but it also keeps just a little bit of texture there as well which I personally like. wine is absolutely delicious here's one where it's a totally gray day and again it's a, a lovely atmosphere to shoot this in I have to shout out to Norman McCluskey because uh, he was the first person I saw take a picture uh, of this location in these types of conditions and I always like to reference the uh, people when I feel my shot is uh, similar to theirs um, so shout out to Norm um very very gray and that's absolutely fine for this location it, it works good and what i've done we're going to take a little look at the processing of that is i've toned the gray very blue i i always make gray very blue and i've just increased the contrast on the stack itself um one more for good measure an upright version and nice bit of swell there and you can see I've lightened the white of the swell just to create a little bit of shape in the foreground with some dodging and burning there uh, a few questions coming in uh, let's have a look uh, Chris has just joined how are you Chris uh, Greg is asking me can you shoot from below uh, yeah you can actually shoot from below Greg but you have to um, you have to climb into kind of down along a ridge and you get into a cave and there's actually some lovely shots of it from the cave but it's a little bit dangerous um honestly going down there i would never bring a group down there personally i have been in there myself you have to have a very low tide and you have to kind of go in you know an hour before the low tide and make sure you're still coming out when it's a low tide because people have got caught in there um loads of times before funny story about it myself and Michael and Dara that particular evening that we went down there at about two o'clock in the morning we decided we were going to go into the cave to shoot some astro and uh, we'd all had a few glasses of wine and we started walking down there with the camera gear and we got like about 100 yards and just went you idiots we're not going anywhere down there um, after having a couple of glasses because it's quite dangerous um, yeah but it's it's stunning from up top there there is an issue with the horizon line we're going to talk about that a little bit in the processing now 
uh, focal length don is asking me what focal length i used uh, most of the shots i have shot here i've shot on a 24 mil tilt shift lens um, so 24 for me gives you something like that you can see look <laughs> they're all the look at the consistency i found the exact same point three totally different three do totally different occasions and for me it was just that point where i could see that triangle uh in the front of the stack as opposed to the slightly flatter one which still i think looks really good but um maybe with this flatter one the way i've shot it i haven't quite gone far enough over to the left it's not totally flat there's like a little bit creeping in on the side which is kind of annoying um but i personally prefer this angle is 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 how i like to shoot it anyway great location though and that's what not to do Uh, quick little look at uh, a couple of points around how you process your files from Dan Patrick Head, Dunbrishta. Here's the exact file um, that we just looked at, okay? I'm going to show you a tr couple of tricks here with this file. Um, the first thing I would say is that what you want to do is have a mask that separates out the stack and everything behind it. And you want to darken the sky and kind of bring the light into the stack or bring the feeling that the eye is directed in towards the stack. So to do that, I would select the sky and I would intersect the sky with a linear gradient and pull that down like so. And that helps straight away because this stack is so kind of clearly defined within the landscape. It's very easy to just hit select subject and it'll just grab the stack for you, like really easy to do that. And once you have the stack, you can, of course, also duplicate and invert and um, once you've duplicated and inverted you have everything but the stack and i would suggest on a gray day making that a little bit bluer and that's what i did in the previous shot anyway and also what i would suggest with the stack itself is applying a little bit more contrast lift the whites and lift the clarity And you can see really quickly there, look, with just a few moves, how we've kind of created this warm to cool transition because the color of the stone was already a little bit warmer. And then we've just increased the blue uh, in everything around it. I know there's a little few bits coming in down the bottom here that we'd need to clone out, but you can quickly see with Dunbrishta because you can select the subject and it's gonna grab the rock, you know, how you can, how you can work the picture then um from that point the other thing which is a real pain in the backside with Dumbrista as a location is the horizon line i mean it's such a great place to shoot i don't think it's a deal breaker but it is annoying the way it crosses just over the top of the picture for sure and um, so whenever i see pictures of it that haven't made any done any work on that horizon line it, it it's a it's a big no-no for me anyway because it's it's obviously in such a crucial position so what i normally do with it is I take a radial and I draw it right across the middle like that and I pull that radial all the way out along the horizon line like so and, and what I do is I do minus clarity and I do minus texture and you can see that that's really remove the edge of the horizon line there but it's totally screwed up the rock of course but because we know we can get the rock in a selection through subject select very easily we just hit subtract and subtract subject and there we go and now it's just smoothed out the background but left the contrast intact on the rock and if you want to go wild you can duplicate that and make that background even smoother so that's a big deal with that horizon line uh, not being a not being a distraction, and I haven't finished the editing of this, but that there are some of the key moves that I would be considerate of if I wanted to do Dan Patrick. And you can see as I've more done a finished version of it, you can see I've smoothed that background and done some dodging and burning and lifted the contrast in the rock quite significantly. So that's down Patrick Head. Last but not least, 
Um, any questions there, guys, uh, on that actually? So I don't miss the question and then start into the the next the next chapter of things. Give me a chance to drink a bit of wine as well. Nothing coming in so far. It'll probably be the same. I'll start and then I'll see the uh, the questions come in. I'm gonna just check the um, I'm gonna check the Facebook feed quickly, just to see if there's anything any questions there. Uh, someone's asking me, do I have an image without the tilt shift? Uh, I do not. I do not. I've never uh, taken it without the. Uh, I've never taken it without the uh, the tilt shift. But look, what I will say about that is, because you're on a cliff with that location, you know. You're not. You're not pointing dr dramatically downward, even without the tilt shift. But just be careful of that, like. You know, if you're shooting there, get down at a lower angle and point out rather than have your tripod right up so you're kind of looking down on it. You know, there's things that you can do to mitigate how much you point the camera downwards, you know. Um, so I think you can get away with it without using a tilt shift, absolutely. The tilt shift helps because you just go straight and then you just shift down and uh, it really keeps it very upright. But if you're up on the cliff, just have your tripod down low and point out, but just don't have it up high and point dramatically down. You're going to have to point down just a little bit and you can always correct it a little bit as well. Barry's asked me for tips on sandy mount. I'm sorry, Barry, but uh, you're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to come to the next, the next Dublin Bay uh, webinar because if I, uh, if I go into that, Nothing will get done. Okay, Glendalock. Uh, so Glendalock for me um, is a place that I photographed for so many years. Absolutely incredibly beautiful place, close to my home here in Dublin, um, and uh, you know really accessible uh, as a landscape photography location for everybody. Um, and um, I have to say that I've continued to go back there over the years, and I hope that I'll be photographing there for many a year to come um, and you can see Glendalock here uh, it's in Wicklow we have two lakes which are the kind of main areas I was going to discuss the lower lake and the upper lake um, the upper lake tends to be the one that's more photographed uh, but the lower lake is absolutely beautiful as well and there's lots of interesting uh, things to do there too I think so I'm going to discuss Glendalock a little bit in the context of a couple of things about the classic view, um, a couple of things about using your long lens there and the detailed shots that you can get there, and then a couple of things about wide angle compositions that are a bit the road less travels, let's say. I'm not gonna talk about the lighting angle too much in Glendalock because while the lighting angle is very important, I find that I'm shooting a lot of my pictures just in shade in Glendalock. Um, or with just a little bit of light across the top of the mountain because the light doesn't come right into the valley really um, and the, it, I just don't find it's quite as important so for example you know if you're shooting from the upper lake it's basically backlit all year <laughs> like it's backlit from the north you're shooting this way it's side to back in the summer and then it's side to back in the winter and then it's totally backlit in the autumn at sunset but it's always backlit <laughs> you know so it's um it's not quite as uh, not quite as relevant you know um so i'm not gonna not gonna discuss that in in too much detail don is just asking me um if there's a recording you watch it later yeah you'll be able to find it on youtube don or back in the facebook event it'll it'll still be there um so no worries about that okay so Glendalock, as I said, for me, just what a what an iconic place um, that's been ingrained in my own landscape ph photography journey for uh, so many years. And, um, you know, as I said, I hope I continue to go back. And this is the classic view from the upper lake. What you're looking for, certainly with Glendalock, is low wind. 
you know you're absolutely looking for low wind and calm and reflections and that really makes all the difference so upper lake here for example the really old picture on my pentax 67 film shot i actually arrived late for the sunrise i was still in my 20s in my defense when i took this picture I took this picture probably about 2009 something like that um and i slept in and <laughs> i arrived down the mist was still there um and uh, it was still it still got a still got a really interesting shot but yeah those reflections at the upper lake are absolutely key even if it's totally misted in up there which you can get these days of just absolute intense mist you can use the classical sort of rocks in the foreground like in this particular shot and i like how it just disappears into nothing again this is a you know a picture that's 15 odd years old uh taken on the taken on the old film camera back in the day you can see the format of it's like a little bit squarer um whereas the 35 mil is you know three by two this is a six by seven format so it's just a little bit squarer looking and you know when i was working on that wicklow project personally i went there in all sorts of conditions and uh yeah also managed to get in there with some beautiful fresh snow and uh, this is one of the shots for me where i realized how much i liked gray being blue and this was just a byproduct of the film because this is a, a, a picture that i shot on film it's not um it's not manipulated in in the context of adding the blue in post-processing uh, it just was Fuji Velvia and Fuji Velvia used to turn things very blue. So that was the context for that one. The lower lake, the lower lake is, is not as popular as the upper lake, but if you park at the, uh, if you park at the hotel, let's say, or somewhere around that lower lake area and walk up, it's, you know, it's about 10, 10 minute walk or something, but that little initial inlet uh just as you uh as you as you arrive is absolutely stunning and you know this particular image was taken on you know persistently cold weather over a few days the lower lake does not get light into it um during the day and in the winter and it can just absolutely freeze um all along the bank and you get this incredible frost so look at this section of the shot here and then if i go on to the next one that's that same section but look you can see that tree there but i've shot this with a much longer lens and i've processed it high key and i've shot it high key as well because there's no sky so it's much easier to make this much brighter without blowing out the sky and obviously you can always blend in these situations but if you make the sky or if you make the the trees in the center very bright and then you try to blend in a dark sky it looks ridiculous it just doesn't fit together and that's a big thing with blending is people are trying to figure out the mechanics of you know where do i hit the merge to hdr button or how do i use a layer mask or something like that and that's of course that's all necessary that's the first part of the process of figuring out how to blend exposures but really the harder part is understanding what matches together um and you know like anything in photography and creativity it comes down to the decision making um rather than the technical attributes of the software um uh, do i still shoot film and scan david is asking me not anymore david do you know what i have behind me here um in my my office setup i have a, a four by five uh, a large format camera with a like a beautiful 20 millimeter schneider uh prime lens and uh, i haven't had it out in a long time and um i don't know if i will get it back out again I'm not sure I was actually even trying to sell it so if you want to buy it give us a buzz uh, Rebecca says makes for a fab image Rebecca has this image on her wall she bought an acrylic off me of this uh, of this very picture so yes Rebecca you've got wonderful taste it's it's possibly my favorite Glendalock image I love the purples in the um in the frozen kind of trees along the edge uh, and just that little bit of mist and the calm and just the simplicity of it it was a it was an absolutely beautiful morning lisa says that's a beautiful image thanks lisa appreciate it give us an old comment if you like this picture guys um, i'm gonna have a little tipple of wine that's absolutely lovely that wine honestly 
so next up the same morning and um this is uh if we go back three images and we look look at this section here you can see this tree here on the left you can see this other little section in the middle here and this is one tight crop and the, like both of these pictures i absolutely love uh and I know I saw John Moore ask me a question uh, earlier on the thread, and I know John has uh, actually has this picture uh, hanging in his house. Hopefully, he still has that hanging in his house. Anyway, he bought it from me. Whether he's uh, <laughs> whether he still has it hanging in the house, I suppose, is another question. But he did buy it from me, um, and it was just such a stunning morning. And actually, I've been out um, for a significant portion of the night shooting in a different light and doing nighttime stuff, uh, and then. Um, you had feckle sleep but just went out the next morning because the conditions were so good and then we just got this like magic like mist and like trees caked in frost and perfect reflections and yeah it was just unreal unreal those three pictures i just showed you were all taken um you know within like five minutes of each other uh, absolutely stunning uh, a few comments coming in ita says class thanks so much ita jackie says love it and uh, David, lovely images, gorgeous. Karen, thanks so much. Fantastic, Moira. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for all the kind. Thanks for all the kind words. Yeah, so beautiful morning. Lower Lake reflections, and the kind of segue when I was preparing these images was um, to go from here and think about okay, well that's the wide angle of the lower lake, okay, but get your seventy to two hundred out if you're in Glendalough. Like you have to get your 70 to 200 out when you have reflections like the the detail along the banks is absolutely stunning um so you know there's the wide shots down in glendalough but there's also tight shots that this is the same morning when the like the trees were absolutely caked in the frost and it was purple so you know if we go from the three angles or the four shots again we're going the wider shot then we're getting um we're getting this section in one shot we're getting this section in another shot and then the last shot is me which just got i actually walked up really close to it and i just got super tight in on the detail of the tree um uh, just to get that that beautiful kind of structure and 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 shape you know again a 70 to 200 shot this is a picture i took back in the film days it was in the original wild garden project the mist was not that purple but it's a shot on film and the film used to turn that gray color slightly magenta shot on probably velvia fuji velvia maybe provia i used to try and use uh, provia or astia when you wanted a neutral color tone and velvia used to really shift the color quite a lot so depending on on what you wanted but again you can see the picture is square John Marr says his pictures on eBay Jesus John well it must be that it's gone up in value then you know I thought you would have had it in, in Christie's or something to be honest with you um, but um, you can see how uh, it's squarer um, and the coloring with the film but again I love the details in Glendalock I love getting the big lens on and picking out shapes like this and just finding the patterns you know um, another detailed shot this one from the upper lake again picking out those shapes so I also wanted to show you uh, a couple of things uh, about Glendalock in terms of looking at that kind of road less traveled so we've looked at the idea of the upper lake and the lower lake the wide angle shots we've looked at the idea of getting tight on the reflections but there's actually a couple of wide angle compositions that people uh, don't know about or that people don't shoot anyway that i've shot over the years that i've never seen another shot of for example so here's one here i love this uh, reflection this little reflection pool and if i'm looking uh, in glendalock of where this is and i'm just going to oops sorry going to my google maps for a second just bear with me i should have had this prepared earlier but you know i needed to give the wine a little bit of time to breathe and uh, here we go, Glendalock. So the shot I just showed you guys there, it's actually 
right down here. So you walk away from the lower lake and all the way down here towards this river's edge and this little pool reflects really nicely and there's the trees there and that's the resulting picture on a very frosty frosty difficult or frosty cold 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 evening just saw a question come through talking about roads were they difficult getting there um well, that actually particular evening when it was very frosty and cold, Rebecca, we actually stayed over there because I'd been out shooting all night. So we, I think we stayed in the Glendalock Hotel there in Lara and um, we'd been out until, I don't know, three in the morning or something shooting the nighttime project I did. And then we just got a couple hours sleep and then just nipped down there. So I guess if you have very frosty conditions and you can see in the forecast, that it's going to be frosty and cold for a few days you know treat yourself down to the Glendalock Hotel and stay down there a few days you know and then just go out and shoot during the day back in the evening nice bite to eat glass of wine uh, and away you go so that's that um, that's that tree location something slightly different from Glendalock again do you notice with Glendalock that no matter where you go you always see the shape of the valley you, know, you always have this V because you're right in the valley. So here's a here's a shot again with the with the really strong Glendalock V, but it's not taken at the upper lake where you might think. It's actually taken all the way. There's the traditional upper lake spot where people shoot. It's actually this little inlet here. So I've walked all the way down to the miners' village. I've had to cross the river and then walk back. And then you get to this position at the far end of the upper lake. So the far end of the upper lake, you can shoot this pool back towards the traditional view, which is this one. But you can also shoot back the other direction of the upper lake, which gives you this view of Glendalock. So you get two totally different perspectives on that kind of very iconic location by hiking down through the miners' village, cross the river. You've got to be prepared to get your feet a bit wet to get over there and then back around the other side and you get uh, this these two totally different uh, perspectives on Glendalock by going there. And the final shot that I wanted to show from Glendalock is this particular image here. And um, this is again taken down towards the miners village at the far end. And it's funny that you still see the V, <laughs> you know, doesn't matter where you are, you still see this this V, this iconic sort of shape of Glendalock. And honestly, to get this picture, I got so wet. Like, I was standing in the water. Like, I kept edging out a little bit and trying to get the position of the tree a little bit better, a little bit better. And I had my normal boots on. And by the end of it, I was just over the knees in water. I was just soaked. I had to throw the boots out afterwards. I was just fully submerged in the water and once I was submerged in it then I said right well I'd better wait for the reflection to come back as I'd rippled it and I just committed to the committed to the shot and I love this picture of Glendalock I mean it's I I can criticize this picture on a technical level I don't like the way it's more open on the left corner than it is in the right corner with the reeds um that's a little bit annoying to me but I find it for me that so satisfying to go to somewhere that you know so well and uh, to find an unusual uh, perspective on somewhere and sometimes that requires a bit of commitment like <laughs> getting your you know <laughs> above your knees wet in the water um, and it was flooded down the other end and there was mist and it was calm and um, the conditions were just really really stunning and uh, it was a it was a great morning it was a great morning to be out there So I've talked a little bit longer uh, than I intended to talk and um, I'm not going to go too much further. I have a couple of other questions coming in there so uh, I'm going to field the questions and look how slick this new software is I have. I can go straight back into this screen where you can see me with my name and the logo. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed that guys. Um, hopefully there was some insights into the photography. That's the kind of format I've 
trying to do these do these talks uh, regularly and uh, put some hopefully inf interesting information out there. Um, I'm just going to respond to some of the questions here though. Uh, Maria said each one a stunner. Thank you, Maria. I'll definitely take that. You're very kind. Um, David is asking me, uh, do you ever uh, do you ever use the shift lens to help create panoramic image files? Um, it's a good question, David. Um, or do you, and if so, do you enjoy the process, or is it a hit and miss process? Look, I love um, I love uh, panoramic files. Um, I find with my own uh, tilt shift lens that um, when I uh, do that movement left or right to create a panoramic, and I don't like to um, say this publicly, but I'll whisper it, the edge of the Canon tilt shift is sharper than the edge of the Nikon. I just whispered that really quietly. Um, so when I find when I shift mine with the tilt shift to create the panoramic there's distortion on the edges of it um which i don't really like uh so i tend to just go click 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 and um get a panorama that way you know it's nice to use the 70 to 200 even to do that if you can uh to create the compression and uh i'm just gonna see can i find a file okay I can't see it immediately there in my live, so I was going to try and show you a file that I've shot with the 70 to 200 to create that kind of compressed um, look to my panoramics. Uh, thank you, Mark. Brilliant presentation, as always, really appreciate it. Barry says, Thanks for the usual advice. Don, great presentation. Thanks, lads. All the kind words are coming in. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, it'd be, uh, it'd be fun to, uh, yeah, to continue this and you know, do it in a kind of hopefully a reasonably lighthearted way, but still giving you some insights. And uh, Lisa says two of her favorite things, wine and photography. Well, that's it, Lisa. I Wine and photography are two of my favorite things as well. I absolutely love the wine as well. So um, two of my favorite things. Um, thanks, Joe. Super evening. Thanks so much, Richard. I um, appreciate you watching along. Barbara is having a laugh. Helen, thank you. Um, uh, Jackie, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right because it's spelled J-A-C-Q-U-I-E O'Hanlon. I can pronounce the O'Hanlon, but the Jackie, maybe I'm making a, a mess of that. So apologies if I if I am. Um, and is asking me, is the shift lens uh, the Z series? No, it's the, um, there isn't a Z series tilt shift lens. So you have to use the adapter. Um, I'm also looking at the um, I'm looking at at the moment a 15 millimeter Laowa tilt shift lens because 24 is amazing, but 15 would be 15 would be rocking to have a tilt shift lens. Uh, so I think that's a has a Z mount, and the Laowa um, I think have a 24 as well, and they seem like a kind of a a, a more reasonably priced uh, entry point in if you want to get. If you want to get tilt shift lenses so something to look l a l a o w a lawa um chaz is yearning for a bit of ireland after that a bit of era chaz we'll have you back we'll give you a couple of couple of whiskeys chaz and a few laughs um so yeah you're always uh you're also always welcome back thanks dino for the comments Edward, thank you very much, and David, and Paul, and David again. I'm just searching through, there's so many thanks. Noel, I haven't seen you in a while. Noel, Cody, how are you, sir? I'm um, glad you enjoyed, mate. Carla, Rebecca, all lovely, uh, very <laughs> lovely comments. Robbie says, don't spill the wine on the keyboard. I can tell you a story. My, my good wife spilled a whole glass of wine over my MacBook Pro in the first, in the first lockdown, and it uh, wasn't good, and it was good burgundy as well you know so uh not ideal not ideal don't spill the wine on the keyboard happened to me <laughs> yeah yeah it's an issue it's an issue jeff is there hey jeff ken is there thanks so much vivian helen david larkin is there loads of people there loads of loads of um names that i recognize and uh, loads of names that i don't recognize as well um which is yeah lovely to connect with different people so on that note guys signing off thanks so much for coming We'll be back with another one of these next month. I think we've scheduled eight of them between now and the summer, and then I'll take a break for the summer and then come back. So, good night.
thanks for coming. I shouldn't cheers you without doing that. Now we need to figure out how the hell I turn this thing off. Good night. Take care. Bye-bye.